Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, today's webinar here, Soaring Student Debt and Declining Affinity, How Advancement Leaders Are Addressing the Challenges Ahead. Um, before we kick things off, uh, just a couple housekeeping items. Uh, first, uh, this session is being recorded, uh, and we can certainly make the recording available uh, to anyone who might be interested. Um, second, this is a uh, hopefully a very interactive webinar today. Um, we're hoping to have uh, a really great discussion around, uh, you know, how engagement and, uh, you know, time, talent, and treasure leads to philanthropy. Um, so we'd love your questions throughout the, the broadcast here. Um, we have uh, some time left at the end for some Q&A, um, but if possible, we'd love to kind of address your questions as we go through uh, today's presentation. Um, lastly, if you do have any technical difficulties with the uh, GoToWebinar uh, control panel here, uh, you can go ahead and type those into the question box. Uh, and we'll do what we can throughout the kind of the hour uh, we have planned today to address uh, those technical issues. Um, great, so uh, let's kick things off here uh, with just a quick agenda. Uh, so for the next 45 minutes to an hour, uh, we'll introduce ourselves, introduce our speakers today. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, this alumni equation that we at People Grove have been talking about over the course of, uh, of three webinars here. This is part three uh, in a five part series. Um, then we'll have a, a conversation with uh, Heather Potts Brown, who's joined us from Villanova University, uh, and then that time at the end to uh, have that Q and A uh, towards the end of our hour today. Uh, but again, would love those questions as we as we go through here. So, with that, I'll ask uh, Heather to introduce herself. Sure. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining the webinar today. Um, as was said at the beginning, I work at Villanova University as the Associate Vice President for Development. I have been at the university for the last ten years. So during a tremendous time of growth and opportunity, not only with our uh, alumni engagement, but certainly on the philanthropic side, um, and two national championships certainly did not help or did not hurt our efforts at all and something that we're really proud of, as well as becoming a nationally ranked institution. Great. Uh, and for myself, my name is Matt Kelly. Uh, I'm the business development manager here at People Grove. Uh, prior to this role, I was uh, the associate director of alumni career services at Georgetown University. So not uh, recent national championships, a final four in 2007, but you know, we'll, we'll get, we're getting there. Um, and at Georgetown, I was uh, responsible for the uh, student alumni networking communities that we were building through the alumni association, uh, which is how I was introduced to people group. Um, and thrilled to be over here now on the People Grove side uh, and working with folks like Heather and our 250 plus university partners. So before uh, we get into our conversation here, I just want to kind of give a brief recap of some of the, the topics and things that we've been talking about over the course of the past uh, two webinars. Um, in our first one, we talked a lot about value and we were joined by uh, partners from Kansas and uh, Fresno State to talk about uh, their alumni surveys and what they were trying to identify out of those surveys, surveys was the value that alumni were continually looking for out of their institution. Their hypothesis was that the transaction between student and institution is no longer complete on graduation. That transaction is a lifelong transaction um, and universities and institutions need to continue to provide value for their alumni. That in value, identifying that value, led them to engagement topics. So in our second part, we talked a little bit with our CEO, Adam Saban, here at People Grove about some of the engagement opportunities that we are looking for um, when we think about our work with our partners, as well as when we think about um, you know, what kind of things we can build in our own product. Today, we're going to talk mostly on the end part of this equation and talk about how those things that we've discussed in the, in the first parts of our webinar series are leading to the philanthropic outcomes um, that a lot of alumni institutions and many you know, alumni relations offices and alumni associations are thinking about when it comes to that engagement. So how are we flipping the script a little bit in terms of time, talent, and treasure? We always ask alumni to give of that talent, give of their time, and then eventually their treasure. But how are we as institutions um, pro providing and investing our time, our talent, and our resources and treasure into their continued success? So with that, let's jump into our conversation here with Heather. Heather, can you give us a little bit of a background on your role, some of the things you're working on, and some of the things Villanova is thinking about with their fundraising goals? Sure, absolutely. Uh, to begin, we closed out our last uh, comprehensive campaign in May of 2018, and we raised $760 million against a $600 million goal, which is obviously something that we're all really proud of. 
One of the things that I think was really unique about the campaign and what we were trying to do with shaping that is really make it a campaign where everyone could be involved at any level. Certainly, we all know that larger gifts drive the campaign, but we really hit home the message that every single person, regardless of their giving level, was going to be part of, for the greater great, the Villanova campaign. Um, one of the things that we're also really excited for us of our donors that made major gifts, which for us started at the $100,000 level, 80% of them were first time major gift donors. So one of the things that we had heard a lot of from our board, um, from alums who had been very philanthropic in the past is, you keep coming back to the same people over and over again, go find someone new. And we feel like we were really able to do that. And so when we think about those new first time major gift donors, that's really gonna become the foundation in our seven figure gifts and our next campaign, which certainly we're not um, launching a public phase of a campaign anytime in the near future, but within the next couple of years, and we really needed that foundational um, part. The other thing that I think is really impressive is we had well over 78,000 donors who contributed at some level during that campaign, and nearly half of them were first time donors to the university. So again, when we think about the tools that we had to engage our alumni and how that relates to philanthropy, not only having so many first time major gift donors, but having so many people who were making gifts to the university for the first time during this effort was something that we were really proud about and really distinguished this campaign from previous campaigns at Villanova. So I, if I could, could dig in a little bit to when you said go find someone new, I'm wondering how you went about that process. Uh, I, I, we often hear about, even in volunteering, when you have alumni who come back and volunteer, it's usually that same group of volunteers. How are you kind of reaching out to those that weren't previously engaged? Sure, absolutely. We used a lot of referrals. Um, you know, we looked at our people that were engaged, you know, or had relationships with other folks that we felt like had some capacity and worked really through a volunteer structure to help us identify some of those folks and make those connections. Beyond that, we hired and really increased our sales force or our you know, frontline fundraising team. And part of their individual metrics beyond you know, raising certain dollars and having certain number of visits and managing their portfolio is also looking and tracking how many first time or brand new visits that they're having. So we expect everyone who's a major gift officer or an officer at Villanova to do some level of discovery work and engagement work beyond you know, just hitting their marks in terms of, yep, I, I got my 18 visits this month, and yep, I had my solicitation goal this month. And so that's really been something that we've ingrained in our culture with our frontline fundraisers, and that's really what has allowed us to go out there and find those new people. Also, um, you know, trying lots of different techniques. Uh, you know, people do say no and sometimes aren't always willing to have that conversation or accept that visit. So how do we kind of reinvent and reinvigorate, you know, our pools, maybe trying a new gift officer, a strategy with a dean or somebody else on campus to help make those introductions and have that person make that first time um, agreement to, to a visit was something that was really important for us. Awesome, awesome, thank you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the, the focus of the campaign? Were there any particular, uh, you know, strategy pillars or, you know, priorities that Villanova had identified as, as pieces that they wanted to be involved in that $650 million campaign? Sure. Um, yep. So within um, the original goal of 600 million, we had four main campaign pillars. Uh, yep. Capital projects certainly were a part of that. Growing the endowment was important for us. Uh, unrestricted giving, which is core, I think, for a lot of institutions, was certainly core for us. And so we had an unrestricted giving goal. And then we had what we referred to as our academic and programmatic support, which was really the restricted operating to fuel our academic experience and student life experience for current and future students. So those were the four main things that we focused on. The largest single goal when we looked at that $600 million goal was a $250 million goal for our endowment. Uh, we are a little bit behind our peers um, and aspirant schools in terms of our total endowment. So that was something that was certainly a priority for the university moving forward to make sure that we can kind of continue to enhance financial aid amongst many other things for our students. Yeah, if I could dig in a little bit there as well, you talk about kind of academic and student life, financial aid being a huge piece of just making that academic and student life available to, you know, all students. Um, but was there anything else additionally, like kind of, you know, on the ground, as it were, that Villanova was looking to improve about the overall experience? Sure. I think beyond, um, you know, looking at obviously increasing financial aid, which is so important, 
internship opportunities, um, and then beyond graduation, helping students identify areas um, early on that they were interested in for careers, making sure that we had strong mentors and alums that could help them navigate kind of corporate America or the nonprofit sector to help make sure that they were getting placed into jobs early on was something that was really important um, for us as well. So again, you talked early on at the beginning of this that it's, there's that need for the relationship to continue beyond graduation, and that's something that continues to be really important to, to Villanovans. I think one of the catchphrases that you hear a lot of alumni from Villanova talk about is Villanovans helping Villanovans, and it's something that tr certainly ran true um, throughout the campaign and beyond the campaign, where we have people that are saying, you know, geez, my company could really use some interns, and yes, they typically have pulled from the Ivy Leagues, but how can I make sure that they're also looking at Villanova students to participate, you know, in internship programs and then in job placement programs as well. That's great. That's awesome. Um, you, you talked a little bit already about some of the, the kind of the core strategies and tactics that kind of got you to to ex exceed your campaign goal, um, especially around that discovery, frontline fundraising, making sure that they're out there making, you know, getting in touch with people that they and finding someone new. Um, I'm curious if there's any other thing you might be able to share, any other strategies or tactics that kind of helped along the way in reaching that goal. Sure, absolutely. The other thing that I didn't really touch on, um, but I will dive in a little bit more on, is our alumni participation, which was something that was really important and something that our Alumni Association Board and our partners and colleagues in the alumni office really spearheaded that effort as well. Um, we had a very robust volunteer campaign structure, and one of our committees was really an annual giving campaign that was fueling alumni participation. When I joined the university uh, 10 years ago, our alumni participation was roughly 16%, um, which was not good, not something that Villanovans were proud of. And so one of the other goals beyond the dollar goals for the campaign was to increase alumni participation to 30%, um, which for anyone who has worked in a development office or worked at an institution that cares about participation, it's not like you can just snap your fingers and, and make it happen. Um, I wish it was that easy. If it was, we'd be at 60% like Princeton, but we're not quite there yet. Um, but we really, really tried to like dig in a little bit and look at why some of the reasons were the Villanovans were not contributing. And I think a lot of folks have seen this over the years where sometimes younger people are like, you know, I can only give 25 bucks. My 25 bucks isn't really going to make that big of a difference when you're looking at tuition room and board close to $70,000. And so debunking a lot of those myths letting people start to understand how their small gift not only helps drive participation, but when we add a lot of those small gifts together, it's creating some really robust opportunities for the university. So that was something that was really important um, you know, to us as well. I think too at the core with anyone who's in campaign or trying to reach people, increase the number of major gift donors, increase their engagement with alumni, we spend a lot of time behind the scenes and with our research folks and our records folks, making sure that we have good data. Um, and also just finding new ways to reach out to people. Maybe you don't want to receive a phone call or an email, but if I connect with you on LinkedIn or Facebook or in some other way, it can create a meaningful interaction and a more comfortable way for some of our alumni to engage, whether it's with gift officers, folks who work in our alumni office, or volunteers. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I kind of took a quick note here about participation because I feel like a lot of times when we look at campaigns, there's that major, you know, huge fundraising goal, that 600 million, that, you know, 1.5 billion. Um, and there's also a participation rate goal. And I think that's a lot reflective of the idea that everyone's gift matters. Um, okay. And the participation rate metric is the one by which your annual fund givers, your young alumni, your, you know, recently graduated alumni might be more focused there versus your principal transformative gifts, those 100,000 and above. Um, and I'm recalling my own experience at Georgetown in the middle of our campaign. Um, we had a, a participation rate goal as well. And I rec remember getting just shy of it. We were, you know, shading off of it. And the effort just to get up to that, like once you get close to the goal, the effort to get there is just so much more concentrated and frankly, just larger um, right. to that participation goal. Yeah, people um, forget that you're starting at zero every year at the beginning of the fiscal year. So you need to retain donors, get the new folks. It's, you know, takes a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, shifting gears a little bit to talk about higher ed philanthropy overall, maybe just kind of stepping back a, a little bit away from our own respective experience and in institutions. Heather, what are you seeing as kind of the biggest challenge in, in just what you described about 
starting at zero and retaining donors, building those donors. What are what are your donors caring about that you know we're trying to kind of service and give them in, in an advancement uh, capacity? Sure. I think one of the things that we have seen is that there are a lot of there's a lot of competition out there. Um, you know, when you think about your social media feed, your local news, the newspaper, even like student groups on campus, there's a lot of opportunities to engage and to give back to worthy causes. And sometimes I think higher education, I don't want to say can get lost, but sometimes people don't understand that that investment in you know, higher education is actually fueling resources for our students to go out there and have these great opportunities and kind of become the next leaders in the nonprofit world, develop the next great thing. And so trying to sometimes make that is a, is a challenge that we all see. Um, there are a lot of, again, great causes and big brothers and big sisters. And you think about people supporting their own religious organizations. Um, and sometimes even beyond that, wanting to support maybe where their son or daughter is attending school, whether it's a, a middle school, a high school, or their own college experience, where they say, you know what, I'm going to put my own alma mater on hold for a little bit because I want to invest in where my son or daughter or grandchild is going. It's something that we certainly see and we hear a lot from, from our own alumni. I think the other piece I touched on a little bit earlier is just not understanding, again, we talk about tuition, room, and board, you know, really from, you know, at Villanova nearing $70,000 at this point annually, and people are saying, you know, geez, even if I'm giving $1,000 and it's costing someone $70,000 to go there, what real impact am I having versus if there's a smaller community foundation and maybe I'm giving $1,000, it feels like I'm having a greater impact. So I think one of the challenges we have is to make sure that people understand the impact, regardless of their giving level, that they're having on the university is something that is, is really important. Um, and then again, another challenge just in higher education in general is there are a lot of schools and colleges that are, have students that are graduating with a very high level of student debt. So if you have people who are graduating with a high level of student debt, maybe they're not getting the best job when they graduate or you know they're struggling to find that job. And maybe it's not at a starting salary that's really extremely helpful for them. You know, they're starting to feel like, geez, I've paid all this money. I'm paying all my student loans. Why should giving back to my alma mater be a top priority for me? And that's mm -hmm. where I think, you know, thinking about the other opportunities that we have for engagement and that value proposition post-graduation becomes so important. Yeah, I'm wondering, to, to go back to the tuition as well, um, I, there's an assumption that could be made that donors, when they see that tuition bill or see the cost of what, you know, a Villanova or Georgetown education is today, um, and they think, well, they don't, they don't need it. They don't need additional gifts because the students are already paying this, you know, very high number of, you know, for room and board and all that. So the, the university seems pretty good and doesn't need my dollar. Um, is that a perception you kind of see as well? Absolutely. And I think one of the ways that we've really tried to make people understand this is that the tuition dollars and room and board cover the bare minimum. You know, it makes sure that we have faculty members that are teaching this, our students in the classroom, that the kids have a dormitory to, to live in, meal seat in the dining hall. But the added value of that private philanthropic support is really what is fueling those opportunities that make a Villanova education unique. So what type of opportunities do we have if a student is taking an unpaid internship but needs transportation dollars to get there? That private philanthropy is helping to, to drive that. Study abroad programs, and I think the international experiences for our students are so important when we think about our, our changing culture and our changing society. But those cost beyond what tuition dollars can cover. And so that's why we've really tried to position it. Yes, if, if people are getting tuition, room, and board and paying that, there's nothing else that's coming in, they're going to get the basic education. But if we really want these folks to go out there and be thought leaders, to be much more well-rounded, and really education beyond the classroom, we need that private philanthropic support. Yeah, absolutely. Um, at the risk of opening a can of worms, I would love to get your perspective and opinion on just the general concept of campaigns, um, because I know that you know most institutions are really focused on campaigns as the core driver to meeting their advancement goals, um, and I think there's a lot of differing uh, you know opinions around the effectiveness of those campaigns, whether or not donors are getting over campaigned. Um, and you know maybe there's some uh, fatigue there. Uh, would just love to get your general thoughts on on the usage of campaigns in higher ed philanthropy and and whether or not it's it's proving effective. Sure. 
Um, I think in general, campaigns can be effective. Um, but I will say this, I think there are certain institutions that do a better job than others at, you know, kind of the timeline of a campaign and what they're trying to achieve. So I think as long as a campaign is purposeful, has a goal, has a start date and an end date, they can be really effective to kind of hone in on a specific fundraising goal. Um, one of the things that I think some institutions miss the mark on is they have this great campaign, they raise the money that they need, and then they take a break. And suddenly you have donors that might be giving for a couple years. They weren't part of the last campaign. They're not part of the new campaign. They're just kind of on this island by themselves. Mm -hmm. In general, I feel like people like to be to belong and feel like they're a part of something. So one thing that we've made sure to do at Villanova is as soon as a campaign ends, the next one has started, even though there might not be a formalized goal um, or, you know, all of our kind of benchmark set or our key priorities for fundraising. But I want to make sure that if a donor wants to give a gift today, because the timeline makes sense for them and they're ready to do that, that they feel included in a campaign because we are so driven with those. Uh, the other thing that I think can be really helpful when we think about campaigns, for us, they always align with our strategic plan. So at Villanova, we just launched our new strategic plan this September. So as many people can imagine, over the next like two years, we will be taking that kind of new strategic plan on the road, which will lead into a feasibility study, which will lead into then the public phase of the next campaign. And so for us, when we can tie it to that strategic plan, we know that there's specific goals that the university has in mind. We want to find out what are those sellable highlights so we can go out there, engage people with, and then at the end of the day, be able to fundraise for the majority of that to support the university kind of gives us that defined timeline of what makes sense as well. Yeah, absolutely. Anything in that strategic plan that uh, you might be able to share in terms of, of how that might impact your work? So as the strategic plan is published and goes on that roadshow, um, you know, what is going to be the impact that you're going to see in terms of those priorities? Anything you might be able to share around that? Sure. I think the one thing that I definitely feel comfortable sharing with at this point is we want we still cannot meet 100 percent of the demonstrated financial need of our students. Um, we get closer and closer, but we're still not there. And, you know, you've been talking a lot about Georgetown. When we think about some of our key uh, peers and aspirants in Georgetown and B.C. that can meet 100 percent of the demonstrated need of students, that's a key priority for the university. So that, far, you know, absolutely will be a goal of the next campaign, and it is a goal of our, our strategic plan um, as well. The other thing that the university has really been committed to um, in recent years, and we continue to make sure that we are fueling these efforts as well, is the commitment to not only sustainability, but diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so although I can't share everything that's in the strategic plan until it's kind of um, officially formalized out there, those are other key priorities that people will be able to, to find in, in the body of work. Oh, that's great. Yeah, absolutely. Um... I love the 100% of need. I mean, there's a lot of schools out there that are, are, in terms of their enrollment and admissions, are either need blind or full need, need you know, or both. Um, so that's a fantastic goal. And and uh, and I'm I'm curious as to, uh, you know, the the strategy around fundraising for that goal because um, scholarships are such a crucial piece of where institutions need to go in this kind of higher education marketplace. Um, and yet sometimes they could be the hardest things to raise money for. Um, sure. And so it's it's always interesting to see that juxtaposition. Anything you might be able to share around some of the things you are planning on doing around scholarships and or have previously done in the in the past campaign there? Sure, I'll actually share a great story from our last campaign. So we had um, donors; they were actually past parents. Their daughter had graduated a couple years prior, and they themselves had created a fairly robust scholarship at the university and were poised to make a seven-figure or eight-figure commitment to, to the university. But one thing that they said to us is, we want to see how we can leverage our philanthropy to inspire others, and we knew scholarship was in their wheelhouse. So we actually created a scholarship matching program. And so for us, our major gift, our, our um, scholarship threshold for an endowed scholarship is $100,000. And we felt like, geez, you know, we do have some people that we think could stretch and get to maybe 75, but that threshold of 100 is a little too much. So we worked with this family and created this endowed scholarship matching program. So if a donor would do $75,000, the donor would chip in the $25,000 to create a brand new endowed scholarship um, for the university. And then if someone graduated within the last 15 years from Villanova, they would do a 50-50 match. 
And so for a lot of our recent grads, especially those who worked at like matching gift companies, were able to create an endowed scholarship at a much younger age than they ever dreamed possible because they were committing to $50,000 over a five-year span. And we had this donor who was also willing to contribute 50000 And so in our last campaign, we increased our endowed scholarships by probably going to mess this number up a little bit, but it's well over 600 now. And we nearly, we more than doubled that during the last campaign. And really, we can attribute a big part of that to this scholarship matching program. That's fantastic. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. I want to pivot just a little bit and talk about some of the engagement um, and the alignment between engagement and giving. Um, so if you are, are, have joined us for the past two webinars, um, you might have seen this stat before here, but you know Brandon Bustee from Kaplan University Partners has done some research and studies and found that alumni who feel supported and engaged by their university, particularly in their career growth, uh, they're 2.6 times more likely to donate uh, to their institution. So in pivoting here, I would love to hear, uh, Heather, you know, how are you thinking about alignment between engagement and giving? And where do you think a lot of uh, advancement offices might miss the mark there? And, and what is Villanova doing differently that has led to such success in their fundraising efforts? Sure. I think one of the mistakes that people can make in higher education is kind of separating the two, like saying, okay, this is the engagement bucket, this is the giving bucket. And one of the things that we've really worked to do at Villanova is to make sure that those things are fully integrated and not that, oh, as soon as you engage for something or come to an event that we're automatically soliciting you for a gift or vice versa, but certainly making sure that those things are working in tandem. And mm -hmm. so when we think about um, the idea that we really need to engage people, we know not everybody can come back to Villanova for a reunion or homecoming or a talk with the dean partially because of maybe where they live geographically, what's going on in, in their personal life. It just doesn't make sense. And so we've really tried to create engagement activities across the country and the world where people can come together as Villanovans if they want to in person to gather. And we bring out our, our president a lot, but also deans, faculty members, other guest speakers from the university to try to create those networking and engagement opportunities but then also utilizing online. Today we're doing this webinar. It's much easier for folks to join a webinar than it is to attend a conference sometimes and talk with colleagues in advancement. And so we do the same thing you know, within our advancement team and specifically uh, alumni relations and thinking about those engagement opportunities that can be virtual and still really meaningful for people. Um, and then beyond that, we also we do a lot of tracking of the engagement activities that people are participating in, which can help inform, in some cases, potential giving. So if we know that people are only attending regional events and not coming back to campus, thinking about if their local club has a scholarship fund, that might be more attractive for them to think about giving back to than giving to the school of business where they graduated from. So we're using a lot of different data points as much as we can to help inform those decisions. Does Villanova use an overall engagement score for your alumni? I know that's a, a big trend now that we're hearing across a lot of our partners here at People Grove is the concept of a, a general score or a rating in terms of engagement. We are working on it, um, and it has been an ongoing project for the last year, and honestly, truly a great partnership with our alumni office, our advancement services team, as well as a lot of cross-campus partners, because we're trying to keep in track of, too, our alums are engaging with you know, faculty members in other areas of the university that we might not be tracking. So how are we gathering that data to make it part of that score? But it's certainly something that we have been working on and hopefully within the next couple months we'll have that solidified. Yeah, I think it's interesting you mentioned about how the alumni are engaging across campus and how this is a really kind of cross office, cross silo collaboration to build such kind of a score or understand uh, the data of alumni engagement. Um, I think a lot of times there are alumni engagement is happening on levels across campuses that advancement offices or even alumni associations might not be aware of. Um, okay. Even you know, having a professor invite a former student to come and speak in front of a class is a piece of engagement that is often not tracked and that data somehow then gets lost and you know that engagement can't be measured or, or see what kind of outcomes are, are leading to or out of that type of engagement. So uh, interesting to hear how that big data kind of is playing a role in bringing that engagement and, and aligning with giving. Um, so I, I have on, on the slide here, the concept of time, talent and treasure. And I think that that adage is, is hopefully familiar to, to everyone in terms of, of how that advancement, uh, you know, thinks about, you know, 
getting alumni to give of their time, give of their talent, and then of course give of their treasure. Heather, I'm just curious your thoughts on that overall concept and and you know how Villanova might be thinking about flipping the script a little bit and investing in alumni success. Sure. Um, yeah, I think one of the things for us at the heart of everything is to making sure that we're creating like a meaningful and long-standing relationship and connection with folks. Um, it's not just about you get your cap and gown, you earn your diploma, you walk away and you forget about Villanova. We want to make sure that they are seeing the opportunities that we are providing for them as alumni. And so, you know, one of the ways that we've recently invested in this, and this is also part of our, our strategic plan, is really looking at the experienced career services piece. Um, one of the things that we have found is that, you know, our career center on campus does a wonderful job making sure our students have these great internships and even getting that first job out of college. But, you know, I've been out of school for a few years. I'm working as an accountant. I woke up one morning and realized I don't want to be an accountant. What am I supposed to do now? And, you know, making sure that those folks have a place that they can go seek help, networks, and people to rely on. So our, you know, kind of our alumni career services is something that we have really started to expand. We started with one person kind of in a half-time role and now have three full-time people that are working in that space and certainly an area that we will continue to grow and develop. And I think if you would have asked anyone working in Villanova 10 years ago, is that gonna be a priority? We probably would have said no. If we're gonna hire more people in our alumni office, we're gonna hire people that are working just with our clubs and our chapters, or you know, just focused on reunion or homecoming. But we really see that need to make sure that our alums feel not only engaged, but there's some sort of you know, value or opportunity for them to continue to, to kind of develop in their own careers, make career transitions, or at least think about it, that those are things that they're seeking from their alma mater, not you know, from some other place is a, certainly a priority for us. Yeah, that's great. I think one of the things I, I like how you talked about career transitions there, because I think something that is perhaps overreported at this point is the frequency at which that's happening in, uh, you know, the workplace now. Um, and I think, you know, as people transition jobs every one to three years, they're always turning to some resource to help with that transition. Um, and it's just natural for someone who has graduated from a higher education institution to look back to their alma mater to say, where can I still be supported? Um, and where can I really get some resources that's gonna help me with that career transition? Um, one, one of the themes that I'm, I've, I've kind of seen, Heather, as we've, we've gone through our conversation here is the ability to meet alumni where they are um, mm -hmm. and the investment that Villanova has made to make sure that there are certain engagement activities or certain things that relate to young alumni, to experienced alumni, to retirees, um, and there's all sorts of different levels of engagement there. I'm wondering about the investment in those types of engagement activities and whether or not that was kind of a hard sell to, you know, overall institution higher leaders um, in, in making sure that that type of engagement was provided for Villanovans. Sure. I think one thing that we're really proud of at Villanova is we definitely view ourselves as a community um, with a lot of cross-campus uh, collaboration and investment. So one thing that was really important for us when we think about engagement activities is making sure that we get buy-in from the top right away. And so we have a wonderful leader and our president, Father Peter, who sees the value and the engagement side of things, not just the fundraising side of things, as well as provost, deans, other key directors within our centers, who really have donated a lot of times their time to helping us facilitate these engagement activities. Um, people like to hear from university leaders, whether it's on a webinar, in person, and they don't always want to hear from me or somebody in advancement or development. I, I have no delusions about that. And so when we can bring you know, one of our deans on the road with us, one of our center directors, or someone else who can kind of really provide them with that insight into a specific topic area and what's happening at the university, we have found a lot of value. We couldn't do it on our own. We really had to have the investment and the commitment from our university partners to be able to do that. Great, thank you. Well, the last thing we're gonna talk about here in our conversation, Heather, is uh, the Nova Network. And so as just to, Kind of frame the conversation there. This is uh, some, some research done from the University of Kansas. Uh, you might have seen this on, our, on the first part of our webinar series uh, with Christy LeClay. Um, we talked a lot about the alumni survey that they conducted and, and how they were able to identify career assistance and being the number one place where 
the importance of providing career assist assistance was exceeding uh, the performance of, of the Alumni Association. This was a place where University of Kansas decided to invest heavily uh, to make sure that the alumni needs were being met there. Interestingly, mentoring students was second on that list. Um, so two places of investment where that Kansas identified and, and that Villanova did as well. So um, Heather, I'm wondering if you could share a little bit of background on the Nova network um, and really kind of the goals in creating such a, such a network there. Sure, absolutely. Um, so the Nova Network is the university's professional network, which we launched 18 months ago, so it's still relatively new for us. Um, and there are about 17,000 active users on the platform um, as of today. You know, and during that time, when we think about the 17,000 users, more than 9,000 messages have been sent back and forth between them. So we do view it as a really positive thing where people are utilizing it to, to engage with one another. More than 35% of our undergraduates are active on the platform, so that's great for us to see too. We don't want it to just be about alumni, but we currently we want our current students on there as well. And they definitely view it as an opportunity to engage with uh, former alums that maybe are still new in their career, but also more experienced career professionals. And we have made a concerted effort to make sure our current and past parents feel um, also included on there. A lot of them have really great advice that they can offer to current students and people who are just starting out in their career. The other thing that the platform has really allowed us to do that's been really positive is we have more than 40 different specific groups that um, in the space where alumni can kind of self-identify and connect with people who have similar interests. One of our most popular groups on the network right now is Nova Women Lead, um, as well as Villanova Veterans and the Villanova Public Policy Society. And I think one of the great things for us is when we think about these groups that are on the Nova network that people can opt into, they might not be necessarily networks that we would have shared with specific people. And by that I mean you could have someone who graduated with a chemistry degree who's now working in D.C. in the space of public policy, but based on the degree they received when they were at Villanova, we might not be pushing them to join a public policy society, but on this platform they can go in and self-identify with the groups that they would like to be a part of. So that's been a real win for us um, in terms of just being able to kind of have this online space that is accessible for everyone everywhere again we know not everyone can come back to campus and meet in person and so our international alumni are able to really utilize this and connect as well as a lot of our folks that might not have the resources to come back and participate in things um, on campus all, all the time um, we have a lot of mentoring programs that are available and when we think about engagement with our alums some want to have a long-standing mentoring relationship, but others say, like, I can't commit to that time, but I could do, you know, one conversation once a month with a student to provide them some level of career advice. So, again, when we think about how are we meeting the needs of our alumni and thinking about the time that they have to give us, to make sure that we're not asking them to sign on for a year-long commitment to work with six students, because that might not be feasible. So we're really trying to meet them with the demands that they have um, as well. The other thing, because it's still relatively a new platform for us, and we're trying to engage more people and make them aware, we um, do have an upcoming program that we're marketing as Nova Network November. Um, try not to say it too fast, because it will tongue-tie me a, a little bit when we get there. But during the month of November, we have a series of 30-plus events dedicated to enhancing the professional development of Villanova alumni, graduates, and our College of Professional Studies students. And all these programs and events will take place during the month of November online. There will be some on campus, but throughout the Nova Nation, and so people will become more familiar with the platform and realize the many different ways that they can become engaged, either as a mentor, just someone who wants to um, be familiar with other alums that maybe are working in the career, or again, thinking about maybe making that career transition. Yeah, that's great. There's a couple of things that I, I jotted down here um, that are uh, unique to, I think, the Nova network across uh, our partner community is um, the involvement of parents and past parents. Um, I think that's a wonderful way of bringing additional resources on for alumni and students. But also, of course, you want to keep those parents and past parents within the community for fundraising purposes as well. Um, so it's always great to see, you know, in, in, an additional segment of the, you know, the community being brought on to this type of tool so that uh, they can continue to be involved. Um, the other thing was the, the number of groups that, that the Nova Network has. I know uh, Sheila Doherty, uh, your colleague uh, Heather, came to our conference this year in July and presented on uh, the strategy around groups. 
um, which is a, a little bit uh, unique uh, in our partner community and uh, has seen, frankly, it's, it's probably the most successful organization of groups out there. Um, so it's a wonderful way of engaging in that self-selection and self-identification. Um, taking all of that engagement and all of that data and aligning it with philanthropy, Heather, Heather I'm wondering if, if that kind of, we talked a lot about the university's overall priorities and it seems pretty intuitive as to how this rolls up to it, but I'm wondering if you might be able to share any kind of X's and O's blocking and tackling around you know, how philanthropy is playing a role in the NOVA network. Sure, absolutely. Um, there are a couple of different things that I'll talk about in regards to this. One, we do make sure that our entire team has access to the NOVA network. So if I'm a gift officer working for the School of Business, I also have access to the NOVA network. I can go in, I can see what alums are opting into certain groups. So it's certainly become a platform where our gift officers can utilize it and help them kind of inform some of their decision making when it relates to pipeline and portfolio. Um, beyond that, I think when we think about the self-identified groups, I have some, some specific results I will share of how that has helped inform philanthropy, which I hopefully this group will find effective. I'm sure a lot of people on the call have a National Day of Giving, Villanova does the same thing, we call it 1842 Day, which is our founding year, we do it every September. And when we look at those groups, those 40 groups that have been identified with the NOVA Network, we have some pretty specific results um, from this year's 1842 Day, which just happened in September. So I mentioned already that the NOVA Women Lead is one of our most successful groups right now on the platform. And we have a McNulty Institute for Women's Leadership on campus, which is, you know, a tie-in with that specific group. And on 1842 days, so within this 24-hour period, we had 117 donors donate more than $12,600 to that specific fund. And so for us, when we think about providing a tool where people can engage, and then us as a fundraising organization can take that information and target folks for a gift that makes sense for them. It, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful cycle for us to see happening within the university. Um, another one for us is CASA, which is a center uh, for access, success, and achievement. And we had during, again, 1842 Day, this is a group that's on our network, we had 88 donors give over $6,000. And again, this is just one day of giving, because there's a lot of other giving that's happening throughout the year, but leveraging these networks on that specific day. Our largest one, which is probably no surprise to folks, is we have a NOVA Network group, uh, Villanova Athletes. Um, and there are a lot of people that includes not only our Division I athletes, but some of our ones who played like club sports, et cetera. And we had a variety of different funds that they could support on that day. But we had 903 donors give $185,000 on 1842 Day to support athletics. And again, these were leveraging these groups that we had formed on the NOVA network and helping to reach out to them with a campaign that we felt like made sense and the results were there. That's great, yeah. I, it's, it's interesting, I, I didn't think of the concept of kind of that self-selection and then being able to take those who have opted into these groups and target them with some real impactful messaging around things that they care about. So we talked earlier about how we are working with donors to identify things that they would like to give to. Um, that's a great way of being able to hit that. Um, I know I, you, 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 uh, you talked a lot about those results on 1842 Day. Um, are, there, are there any other ways that you're measuring success with the NOVA network, maybe outside of philanthropy even? Uh, I know it's still early, 18 months into the, uh, the launch of the site, but just curious to hear some of your thoughts on on those results and maybe even talk about uh, some of the engagement you've seen on the platform per se? Sure, um, you know, I talked already about, you know, how many kind of users we have, but we're constantly seeing like increases in our, in our first 18 months. And when we think about, you know, the areas that, you know, like all schools, at one point we had a different network that we were trying to like leverage that we did not find super successful. And so when we were going through the process of evaluation and looking at a new one and we found People Grove, which was great, we're like, this is going to meet all of our different demands and really allow us not only to do what we want to do now, but to continue to evolve as an organization. And so we're thinking about all of those things. The one thing that the platform, I think, in particular, does a really great job of is with these groups, we've been able to target, you know, our graduate students, which before, Previously, 
I don't want to say weren't a priority, but I think that their identification with the university was a little bit different than that undergraduate experience. So that has been something that is really positive, you know, for us. In addition to tracking kind of who's opting into the network all the time, we are really looking at how many people are fully utilizing it. It's easy for somebody to say, I'm going to be on the network to sign up once and then never log in again. So really looking at, you know, what is, what is the age of the average age of the people who are logging in like multiple times is something that we're really like looking at. You know, is it certain like regions? Is it certain careers? Because again, that helps us inform future programming and offerings to, to our alumni. Beyond that, if we notice anything where we feel like there's a group that's not utilizing it, we will do some specific targeting messaging, you know, to those groups. And again, it'll, data allows us to do that to see if there's different things that we could be offering um, to, to help make that connection a little bit stronger. I wish that we had results already from NOVA Network November, but um, next year, by this time next year, we hopefully will have some really good results about how those 30 plus programs that we will be doing will really allow us to expand the outreach uh, of the network. But for us, when we think about this engagement piece, it's so important. And as we have people who are true, maybe non-donors, but suddenly are engaging with the university, have positive experiences, how can we then get them to an event in their region? Or how then maybe when a gift officer is in their area and reaches out, they're more likely to take that visit. So for us, it's all part of that connection and really developing that lifelong relationship with the university. That's great, that's great, thank you. Um, well, we're just about uh, 45 after the hour here. It's uh, 9.46 uh, Pacific time here in San Francisco. Um, I do want to open up the floor to any questions. Uh, don't see any in the questions box at the moment, um, but if there are any questions uh, you'd like to ask Heather, myself, um, we would love to, to be able to answer those uh, here. So I will uh, take a pause here and uh, give folks some time to, to type in those questions. Um, and hopefully we can uh, answer whatever whatever you whatever curiosities you may have. And if not, that is okay as well. We can give you give you about ten minutes back here if that's uh, if if we, Heather and I have covered all the topics. All right, well, Heather doesn't look like uh, entering questions. I think we, we did a great job, I guess. <laughs> um, well, I just want to thank you, Heather, uh, and, and thank the entire Villanova team. Um, you know, Sheila, Doherty included, uh, you guys have been wonderful partners for us here at People Grove. I want to thank you, Heather, for your time uh, today and being able to, you know, kind of uh, give us a peek behind the curtain, as it were, at some of what Villanova is thinking about when it comes to uh, alignment with uh, engagement and giving. So thank you um, and really appreciate your insight. All right, thank you so much. And everyone have a really great day. I, I'm seeing a lot of uh, requests here for the, the slide deck and the recording. We will certainly share those out um, after uh, the, the session here. Uh, but thank you all for attending. Really appreciate the engagement and uh, looking forward to being in touch soon. All right, thank you.